So welcome to the Mechanical Design and Strategy presentation. I'm Josh from Citrus Circuits. All right, then I'm, then I'm Roy from Greenwich, and I'm in the Mechanical Design team. Okay, so let's move on. Okay. okay, so in this presentation, we'll basically be showing you guys how the design process in FRC works. What does that mean? It means how, how do we take the game that FRC presents to us, and in the six weeks time slot that we have, how do we go from just getting the game to having an actual design of a robot ready? <laughs> so it's a multi step. So because it's a pretty short time, we need to have a defined process so we can do it in the most efficient way. So it's a multi step process, and in this presentation, we're going to go over all the steps. So before we get in depth into any of the steps, let's have a overview of all the steps. We first start by reading all the rules the day uh, first releases the game manual. That means, we c that means each team member needs to know all the rules of the game. And this is obviously really important because you don't want to be designing a robot which will have illegal mechanisms on it. What does that mean? The rules have a bunch of design constraints stuff like how much you can extend outside your robot, how much time you can pin another robot, and stuff like that. So it's important that everyone knows all the rules. OK, next step after we read the rules, we need to develop a strategy. We'll first, first we do something called developing the what, in, in determining the what. In this step, we basically determine what we want a robot to do. How does this work? First, in every game first gives us a bunch of objectives, stuff like, for example, shooting a ball, a ball to the goal, so we can break that up to a few objectives, like picking up the ball, transporting the ball, and shooting it. And there's a bunch of stuff like climbing, each game has a bunch of objectives, and in determining the what, we need, want to determine exactly what we want to do. Now, about this step, we won't really go over in this presentation because we'll have a different strategy presentation which will go over this step and determine the what. But what you should know that in this step, we determine our, what our objective is. So after that, we have determining the hows based on the what. Hows basically means how are we going to achieve our what, which mechanisms are we going to use, and we'll get to that in a second. After we, after we determine which mechanisms we want to do the hows, we go into prototyping. This basically means taking our ideas and actually building prototypes of them, try, seeing what works, what doesn't, getting measurements, all of that stuff. And after your prototype phase, you should basically have a big idea of how all your mechanisms are gonna look like, which mechanisms you specifically want to use, and from that, we go to the design stage. In the design stage, we obviously take the mechanisms and the measurements, which we know work because of the prototyping stage. And we use a SOLIDWORKS, so a different CAD program, in order to model a robot in three dimensions. And after we have a full model of a robot, after we planned it out, there's the fabrication stage of actually building it, and again, there's going to be a different presentation about fabrication. Okay, so uh, do you want to continue on to the house? Sure. Okay, so the house, these are the mechanisms that are going to be on the robot. So that could be anything from drivetrain, uh, intake, shooter, etc. Um, so we have a couple of rules for choosing the house. Uh, the first part of it is steal from the best, invent the rest. So what that means is Yes, uh, you, you look at what past teams have done, what past mechanisms have been successful. Um, you can, usually games have a little bit of similar mechanisms and similar rules to previous games. Um, so you can look at previous robots and find out what worked best um, and then adapt them to your own needs. So that's where the invent the rest comes in. Um, you take those mechanisms and you adapt them. Um, so another rule is to keep it simple. You don't want to have an overly complex uh, robot. 
no overly complex mechanisms because um, then it will just become hard to design, hard to manufacture, and then um, if you have a lot of complex mechanisms, then robot is not going to work as well. Unless you're 971. <laughs> um, I think we can move on. Okay, sure. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to go, or we said in choosing the house, we choose which mechanisms. So we want to go, uh, so we want to go on about a few of the most commonly used mechanisms in first to give you an idea of how this process looks like. So we're gonna start with your drivetrain. As simple as making a drivetrain so your robot can move around the field. Sounds, there's actually a bunch of different ways you can go about it and a bunch of different drivetrains. So how do, uh, if you can see, with there's a lot of types of drivetrains. Uh, there's a West Coast drive, tank drive, there's swerves, and there's one which use mechanism and omni wheels. In a second, we'll explain exactly what all of those are, but what you should first know is that we take the, ge the game and through the what which we defined before, we look at what we want our mechanism to do. Do we want to be fast? Do we want to have more pushing power? And through that, we decide which mechanism, which type of drivetrain we want to use. So as you can see, a bunch of considerations, stuff like maneuverability, pushing power, there's cost, which can be a big factor, there's a lot of drive trains which can cost way more to fabricate, and obviously simplicity, because if, you go, because if you're gonna take something super complex, you might end up spending way too much time on it. So that's our consideration. So let's go into types of drive trains. Okay, so the first kind of uh, drive train is the tank drive or west coast drive. And this is the kind of drive time we recommend that you guys use um, because it is simple, it is cost effective, and it um, has a lot of pushing power. So th this is what 1678 has used for a long time. Um, and so basically you can see that uh, we have two independently driven um, sides of the robot. Um, West Coast Drive has uh, counterbalanced wheels, um, so there's no frame on the outside of the the wheels. Um, but this is this is the kind that we recommend that you that you use. And one thing you have to be careful of is the center drop. Um, usually, that's about an eighth inch drop in the center, um, and that prevents wheel scrub. So that's West Coast Drive. Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, one thing I wanted to add about that is that another consideration with the West Coast Drive or the Tank Drive is the amount of wheels you use. As you see, some of the drives, the middle one we have in the picture is an eight-wheel drive and the other two are six-wheel drives. And that also is a bunch of considerations. For example, a four-wheel drive will be way more stable, but it'll have more difficulty turning than a six-wheel drive. So that's important to keep in mind. <laughs> and next up, we want to talk about holonomic drives. And ba first of all, to understand what holonomic drives even are, we need to look at how the tank drives turn. So in order, if you want, if, now, when you're using a tank drive, if you want to get to something on your side, you first have to turn your robot, that means the and taking both sides of the wheels and spinning them at opposite directions. So your robots rotate around its center and then move it forward again. A holonomic drive allows us to just go, for a robot to just go sideways without turning. So how do we do that? Well, usually we use uh, special types of wheels. If you can see on your right, if you can see on your right top, we have a picture of an omni wheel, which is a wheel covered in, with rollers around it. And below that is a drive tration you can use omni wheels for, which is a holonomic drive tration, because you can see each of the omni wheels is tilted in a 45 degree angle. So when you move each one of them, it, it creates a pushing force in a, in a 45 degree diagonal. And 
if and your programming team needs to know which motors to move to which directions so the forces cancel out and you ba you can basically move to four directions using this drive train another type of wheel we can use to achieve this result is the mechanium wheel you can see that on the left the top of the you can see a picture of that on the left top of the slide it's also got rollers on it but they're in a 45 degree angle which if and if they're like you can see below placed in a standard tank formation you can also you roll you can also use different configurations of moving some wheels forward and some wheels backwards to create sideways movements forward movements diagonal movements and so and so so first of all this seems really good obviously but the does definitely have a bunch of downsides the biggest one with these types of wheels is that you won't have any pushing power why is that when in frc a lot of times teams need to clap like ro different robots try to push it out each other if a robot is pay playing defense you try to push you out of the zone where you can score and in a standard drive train you'll try to push him back to stay in your point with a holonomic drive station you can you cannot do that since if he pushes you because your wheels are on rollers, they, you'll just slide sideways. So that's an important thing to remember, that a holonomic drive station gives you more mobility, but in turn, you lose a lot, a lot of your pushing power, and the enemy team can really easily control your position. So that's holonomic drive. All right, so the... Third kind of drivetrain is the swerve drive. Um, this is the most, pretty much the most complex type of drivetrain. Um, so we don't recommend that you use it, but a lot of teams like it because it adds some complexity and it's fun to design. Um, but as you can see, there's a traction wheel that is controlled by uh, one motor per module, um, as well as it can e each module swivels independently. So you get a lot of maneuverability, but it is very complex, it uh, is more expensive, and it is harder to make, um, obviously. Um, so we don't recommend using this one. It's great if you are able to, but a West Coast Drive, again, is going to be the most effective drivetrain for you to use um, in pretty much every category. Okay, okay, so what we wanted to show you in the end is an example of a comparison chart you can use to decide which type of drivetrain you want to use. As you can see on the, on the left side of the chart, we have a bunch of parameters like agility, strength, uh, the amount of motors you need to use, the difficulty to program the drivetrain, and what you can do with something like this is to look at is to compare a bunch of different drivetrains like this side by side give weights as you can see there's a row with weights to see how important each one of these things is for you and to use that to decide which type of drivetrain you want to use use and obviously the weights you determine in your what in your what if you want to be a faster robot if you want to be a stronger robot it's a bunch of that stuff which leads up to choosing which drivetrain you want to use. So let's go to intakes. Okay, so intakes, this is the second mechanism that we're gonna go over. Um, intakes, pretty much every year there's a game piece that you're gonna need to pick up or shoot, um, which either way it involves intaking it. You have to be able to get it into your robot in order for you to manipulate it. And so um, there's two of the most common kinds of intakes, which are roller intakes and claw or arm intakes. Uh, roller intakes work well um, for pretty much everything. Um, as you can see on the left, we have uh, 6078's 2014 robot. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's uh, plastic pieces of, uh, there's polycarb that hold up the wheels. Um, those actually uh, actuate downward, and then we can spin the wheels and intake the yoga ball that was that year's game piece. Um, that worked very well for us. Uh, 
And on the right, we have our 2015 robot. Uh, again, it has roller intakes. Kind of hard to see from the picture, but um, it has roller intakes that intake uh, these totes uh, that you see in the middle. Um, so roller intakes are very reliable. They're easy to design and easy to manufacture. Um, they're not very complicated at all, like claw and arm intakes are. Um, and so they're very, very effective, um, and they can uh, be used for pretty much anything. One thing you do have to be careful of when you use these is um, compression. So a lot of times there will be a ball or something um, that is a little bit squishy. Um, and so you have to you have to figure out what is the best amount of compression that uh, you need uh, to be able to um, effectively intake a ball. Um, so, uh, for example, for 2016, we determined that about two inches of compression um, would be perfect for the 10 inch dodgeballs that we were using uh, in the game. So, that it, other than that, roller intakes are going to be very effective. Um, all right, let's move okay. on. Okay, so the next thing we want to look at is shooters and manipulators. A lot of time, first we'll give you like the game piece and you need to do something with the game piece. A uh, lot of times it's take tubes and put them on hangers. A lot of times it will be balls which you need to shoot into goals in order to score points. And so basically once you have the intake, once you have the game piece on your robot to use the intake in order to take the game piece, you need to do something with the game piece in order to score points. And that's where shooters and manipulators ca come in. It's a bunch, they're basically all a bunch of ways to take your game piece and put it on the scoring platform or whatever you need to do that year. So there's obviously many, many, many types of manipulators and shooters. It's a very large topic, but we're gonna go over the four most common ones in FRC now to give you an idea of some of, of how some. Huh? Hello? Uh, excuse me? Uh, we can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, are we ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay. So the next, um, so the first part about shooters and manipulators is the elevator. Um, this is a pretty common um, manipulator um, for lifting objects. Um, we've used it for several different games. Um, on the left, you can see our 2015 robot again. Um, that one lifted the totes to be able to stack them. Um, elevators are very useful in, if you need to uh, lift uh, objects over a long distance. Um, and they're easy to design, easy to make. Um, in the middle, you can see 118. No, no. yeah, yeah, 118 is robot. <laughs> um, it's similar to ours again 2015 another game that was used before would be the 2016 game um, we used it on our robot to be able to climb the tower okay okay Hang on just a sec okay Okay, do you want to move on? Yeah, we can go ahead and move on. Okay, sure. Okay, then let's go on to arms. So basically arms is, as you can see in the picture, uh, anything which you, well, an arm on your robot. It's mostly, they're mostly jointed arms. As you can see, the one on the left has two joints, the one on the right has one joint, and we use them whenever we need to take a game piece in a really far away place and to have complete control off of them. Elevators are really simple ways to lift the game piece, but sometimes we'll need to have more control over that and that's when we'll use an arm. An additional thing is that on the end of an arm, you can also 
usually put a, another kind of mechanisms. As you can see on the right one, for you on the right robot, there's actually a roller gripper on the arm. So that robot could actually use the arm in take something with the roller gripper and then move the game piece using the arm while the roller gripper is still holding it. So uh, these are basically arms. Okay, shooters. These are pretty useful for uh, most most games. Um, so the most common kinds of shooters are the catapult and the flywheel. Um, both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, the catapult is can be a little bit more complicated to design, um, and it you can run into several different issues. But uh, it can also be very accurate and very consistent. Um, and the second kind is the flywheel, which you can see on the right. And uh, this one, the ball was uh, came in um, on the bottom and got shot out of the top. Uh, I believe that's Green Blitz's shooter from 2016. Am I right about that? Yeah. yeah right. Okay. Um, so both of these, um, there are some design considerations. Uh, one of them for the catapult is that the ball or whatever object it is, usually a ball, um, is going to roll off of the tip of the scoop or fingers or whatever you want to call the end of the catapult um, as it launches. So you have to um, think about that. It takes a lot of prototyping to be able to come up with a catapult that works um, consistently. Um, and it can also be pretty complicated. You can also you also have to uh, figure out whether you're going to use um, pneumatics to fire the catapult or surgical tubing or springs or some other um, kind of um, actuator. Uh, for flywheels, uh, it's a motor typically because it is spinning. Um, it needs to be spinning at high speeds and you do need uh, a good amount of compression. Um, you also have to remember, remember that the ball is going to uh, spin as it shoots, and so you have to account for that. Um, other than that, flywheels are generally easy to design. They can be very low profile and easy to package into a robot. Okay, great. Then you want to move on? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sure. Then. Basically, that was a summary of how to choose your mechanisms. There's obviously way more mechanisms which we didn't show, but those were the most common ones. So as we said with the drivetrains, you want to consider what exactly are your objectives and choose your mechanisms according to that. So once you chose your mechanisms, we can go into prototyping. Prototyping is basically before we actually build the entire robot or model it on our CAD software, we want to test all our prototypes, we want to test all our mechanisms, make sure everything works, make sure we know how to properly build them, and obviously make alterations where is necessary, since how the mechanisms works best. So this step should like take about two weeks. If you properly manage it, you'd want, once you have your mechanisms, you'd want to sleep to split up into teams of a few students. Each, each one is in charge of prototyping a different mechanisms. You'd want to build your prototypes. For example, you'd build your prototypes out of like a cheaper material than you'd actually robots. You can use wood and stuff because they don't need to actually play the game. They're just there for testing. So once you build your prototype, you test that they work. Shooters, for example, for example, you know how high the goal is, so you can take a wall, a wall, and like mark where and mark where you need to shoot it, and test your shooter on that wall. Or you can actually build the goal, and you'd want to test your prototypes for that. Um, other stuff you can test, for example, when we're talking about roller grippers, Joss was talking about ball compression, how much you wanna compress the ball. So this is a great time to find out what the right amount for that is. You want to take, you can prototype a roller gripper, build a simple one, and then try different amounts of compression 
to see what works, what intakes the ball the fastest, see what works best. Another thing you could do in prototyping is make sure how your mechanisms work together. For example, you prototype to post a flywheel and a catapult, and you like them both. So you can try, so you can try seeing how much, how well each one works with your intake. If, if you see our last bullet points is putting together prototypes to see if they work together. So you could see if the flywheel or the catapult works best with the egg and to base of that decide which one you want to go off of. And obviously you test what works best. Is for example, going back to the flywheel catapult a comparison, you can see which one is more accurate if you're having more success, the catapult or the flywheel. And at the end of the prototyping phase, you basically want to know exactly your measurements and exactly how, you, how you're going to build each mechanism and obviously which mechanism you want to build. So, uh, yeah, do you want to move on? Sure. Okay, so after you're done prototyping, you're going to want to transfer all of your dimensions that you got from the prototypes into uh, your CAD software, which I believe you're using SolidWorks. Um, so you need to obtain the dimensions from the prototypes. It means measuring everything uh, from like distances between wheels, um, the lengths and widths and heights of everything, um, and you need to input all of that into your robot. What, one of the ways that this is useful is Crayola CAD. What that means, we'll show you a picture of it later. Um, Do you want me uh, to show it now? Yeah, we can go ahead and show it. Okay, okay so this, this is an example of Crayola CAD. So basically what you do is you take all of the dimensions that you have and you put them into um, into a sketch. So this was actually an off-season project that 1678 did last year. Um, so as you can see on the right, we have the uh, the logo from 2014. Um, you can't really see it from the picture, but there's also the high goal off to the right. Um, and we we had an a kind of a claw style intake, uh, kind of like 971s. Um, during the season um, and so we basically just put rectangles and circles wherever like a wheel was or a tube was etc and we were able to get good dimensions from that and we could determine a lot of how the mechanisms were going to work together so that is a very very useful way to uh, lay out your robot before you actually start uh, making the parts so that, that is something I, re I really recommend that you do before you uh, start all the parts and assemblies. All right, let's go back to the other slide. Okay, so after you do your Crayola CAD, after you do your sketches, you're going to create different sub-assemblies for each mechanism. Um, what we do on 1670 is we, we name them um, with numbers. So like we'll have... Uh, 100 be the drivetrain, 200 be intake, etc. Um, and then, uh, and then we have a top level assembly that all of those sub assemblies go into. It just makes your um, your final robot a lot less complicated, and uh, um, it will actually make the file size smaller um, in the top level. Um, and so. You really want to be careful about mechanism integration. Um, you have to check for interferences between all of the parts. Um, for example, you don't want your shooter to be interfering with your intake, or else the ball is not going to shoot into the goal. Um, you have to go through meticulously and check everything um, for every interference that may occur, because it, SolidWorks won't alert you about the interferences. Um, and you have to make sure everything stays within the frame perimeter. Obviously, um, there's different rules for every year about that, but uh, you, it's really easy in the CAD to have something that extends out of the frame perimeter too far or doesn't go all the way into the frame perimeter for starting, con for starting configuration. Um, another thing you want to be careful of is ease of access to the mechanisms or other parts. Uh, for example, you want to be able to easily... Uh, hit the breaker on your 
uh, robot. Um, if you have it kind of buried under all of your stuff on your robot, then you can't really get to it. You also want to be able to easily um, do maintenance on your robot, like tension chain or replace parts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my voice keeps cracking. Um, you, again, you want to keep it very simple. Um, don't overcomplicate it. Um, I can't stress this enough. It, if you overcomplicate your robot, you're going to run into a huge amount of problems and your robot is not going to work the way you intend. So you need to keep it as simple as possible. Um, don't just try to do crazy stuff because you just want to. Um, try to find the simplest way to do everything. Um, and then the next step is to create drawings of parts. Uh, Roy will kind of talk about that. Oh, okay, sure. Then let's go to drawings. So basically, uh, hello. Um, yeah. yeah. Actually, it is really late in Vietnam. It's like midnight. Uh, everybody's leaving. So, uh, can okay. Yeah. Can Can you send us these lines and all? The... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sure. Uh, we'll just try to go quickly through the rest of this. Um, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll you... finish it. In minutes is that okay uh okay 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 so the okay so what i want to talk about is part drawings once you have your card you obviously need to somehow take your card and give it to kids who will actually build the robot and give all the correct measurements so we do that with something called part drawings solidworks lets us take a part and create a drawing like you, the one you see on the screen right now. So you can take this axle, for example, and it you can show its, um, its radius, its exact dimensions, and you'd want to create a drawing like this for each part of your robot, so you can easily print this out, and, who's ev and whoever will be making the part can go, can easily see all the dimensions and properly make the part like you planned it in SOLIDWORKS. So. All right, so we have a couple of design uh, tips for you. Uh, you can go to those two links. Um, again, we'll share the slides with you. Um, but in those two links, uh, there's a lot of videos uh, and resources from 973 and 1114 um, that are very, very useful. Um, they, they can go pretty in-depth about it. Um, it. It's a really great resource. Um, so other than that, uh, we have a couple of tips for you. Um, use rectangular tube or extrusion uh, for all of your framing. Uh, don't try crazy angles because you'll run into issues. Um, rectangular tube is really easy. You can, um, If you want to go a little bit uh, fancier, you can use gussets. Um, basically pieces of sheet metal with holes in them and um, that hold tubes together. Um, but don't try any crazy angles. Um, it just overcomplicates it um, and then it won't be simple and you're going to run into problems. Um, also use VersaPlanetary gearboxes. You can get those for, from um, like Vex. Um, don't use too many custom gearboxes unless it's really necessary, like if you can't fit something onto the robot because of cut, uh, Versa Planetary uh, gearbox dimensions, um, or if a Versa Planetary isn't going to be powerful enough, um, then you can use a custom gearbox. But using just um, commonly available gearboxes uh, is really going to uh, make your design a lot simpler. All right, I think we okay. can move on to the last Okay, yeah. then the last slide, we wanted to also point you to some additional uh, useful resources. Uh, the first one is Chief Delphi. I don't know what that is. It's basically a, a form for FRC teams. It's really active. There's, I think, hundreds of threads now about uh, all types of problems the FRC teams had in the past. If you at any time have a problem, the first thing you guys can do is to just search up in Chief Delphi. The problem, and there's a, it's very likely there's already going to be a thread discussing about that. Obviously, if there isn't, you can also ask on Shift Delphi. It's a very active 
website and most likely you'll get an answer. Now the thing is the kit of parts, it's the parts basically first sends you, there's, I think SolidWorks website has a, has a bunch of 3D card models of all of the parts, so you can use that. Another, another useful thing is looking at all the team's card models, at the 3D models. It's really useful. A bunch of teams upload on their website the model, so you can search for that. There's also a website called FRC Designs, which has a bunch of uh, card of robots from previous years, which teams uploaded to that side. And just by downloading the models and looking at them, you can find a bunch of mechanisms, or you can look at how teams did specific stuff, which could help you in the future. It expands your knowledge, and there's SolidWorks help, which basically is on SolidWorks websites. They, if they have a bunch of useful tutorials and explanations about all the features of the software, if you ever have a problem.